great things is that one of the silver linings of holding classes on Zoom is that we're able to easily record each and every one. So if you ever miss a class and would like to uh, rewatch it, just send an uh, email to the OLLI office and we're happy to share it with you. That's uh, no problem at all. And um, if you have questions or comments for Renee or Ken David, you can put them in the chat function, which is found at the bottom of your screen. You, saw, you may need to bring your, in most, on most devices, you may need to bring your cursor down to see it. But if you want to click on the um, chat button down there and just uh, go ahead and just say hello and where, what town you are zooming in from, uh, just to practice using the chat if you haven't used it before. I encourage that and always remember to press enter after you type something in uh, to make sure that we all see it. So, uh, and now I'd like to introduce Lenny Tabs. Lenny is the uh, co-founder of this second summer semester for Ollie. He and Stephen uh, Tobin had the idea that Ollie members and the Berkshire community would really enjoy continuing to have classes into July and August, and uh, it's been a great success. So we're very grateful to him. And I would like to introduce Lenny now. And Lenny is a former board president and a current treasurer and a frequent moderator of today's headlines and all around good guy. Lenny? Thanks, Megan. Uh, good morning to everyone. And, and good morning to Renee. Good morning. Renee is, uh, for those who, who do not know, uh, Renee serves as the Tanglewood Marketing Coordinator for the Boston Symphony Orchestra uh, for, from 2014 to 19. And her program behind the scenes featured many distinguished personalities, including broadcaster and live from Lincoln Center commentator, Martin Buxtam, whom she interviewed for his 90th birthday celebration. Upon graduating from the prestigious High School of Music and Art, which parenthetically my granddaughter uh, also did, she attended the Manhattan School of Music, the Salzburg Mozarteum, and the Rubin Academy of Music in Jerusalem. She's a licensed music therapist and received additional degrees from New York University in both music education and a master's degree in, in educational theater. As a soprano, Renee performed with the Light Opera of Manhattan and currently serves as a cantorial soloist for the Jewish High Holy Day. A resident of Lenox, she has collaborated with presentations on the history of Tanglewood, Leonard Bernstein, and Serge Kusevisky. One of Renee's great joys is to share her knowledge and love of music with others. Uh, we're certainly in for a treat with someone with this kind of experience and background. And we wish you good luck, Renee, and knock them dead. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. And good morning to everyone watching today and joining me for what I know will be just a terrific series of presentations, conversations with great performers. Many of you have seen these performers on stage and film, and now you'll have an opportunity to get to know them a little bit more and ask questions, which is very, very exciting. In the next six sessions, you will hear from some of the most beloved performers of today, including Ken David Mazur, who you will hear later, and Emmanuel Axe uh, next week, Brian Bell, who will be speaking on broadcasting as a very special tribute to our beloved Marty Bookspan on the occasion of his 94th birthday. And then we'll hear from actress and director Karen Allen. And finally, uh, Stéphane Deneuve, wonderful French conductor, who's going to be conducting at uh, the Nobel Prize uh, presentation. And finally, Leon Botstein, uh, one of the most uh, marvelous educators and conductors today. So uh, enjoy the series. I'm delighted to see, see you here. And uh, we look very forward to uh, a terrific series. And thank you, Megan and Ollie, for uh, allowing me to uh, share these wonderful um, performers with you. So on to our first guest, Ken David Mazur. 
uh, a long resume. I'll try to make it as brief as possible, Ken. In 2019, Ken David Mazur celebrated the beginning of his tenure as music director of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. Known as a brilliant and commanding conductor with unmistakable charisma, Mazur has conducted distinguished orchestras around the world, including the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Chicago and Detroit Symphonies, as well as orchestras in France, Tokyo, Russia, Korea, Japan, Scandinavia, and Germany. Formerly a BSO associate conductor, where Ken led numerous performances at Symphony Hall and at Tanglewood, featuring standard works of guest artists such as Renee Fleming, Emmanuel Axe, Joshua Bell, and many others. Mazur has conducted and commissioned dozens of new works, many of which have premiered at the Chelsea Music Festival, a wonderful annual music festival in New York City, founded and directed by Mazur and his wife, pianist Melinda Lee Mazur, and I hope we'll meet Melinda a little bit later on this broadcast. He is also the principal conductor of the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, the principal training uh, orchestra of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and has led orchestras and master classes all over the world, has received recordings, uh, numerous recordings, and received a Grammy nomination from the Latin Recording Academy in the category of Best Classical Album of the Year for his work as a producer on the album Salon Buenos Aires. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Ken David Mazur to From the Podium. Hello. Hi, Ken, how are you? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, wow, I saw my life flashing before my eyes. <laughs> Well, there no. was a lot more, but I couldn't fit it all in. <laughs> it's very kind. It's great to see you. And I'm so happy to speak to so many of you who, with whom I have a feeling uh, I've, I've bumped into every Tanglewood summer. You know, it's been 10 consecutive summer seasons for Melinda and myself. Um, so we are very sad to, to not be able to go. But this way, I feel quite connected. So thank you for inviting me not just um, to talk with you all now, but also as part of the series and that you're giving me both the pleasure and the pressure <laughs> to, to open us up this way. You know, it's, it's great to be part of this. Thank you. Well, you know, you are a Berkshire person. Uh, you have a home here and uh, all of my guests are closely associated with the Berkshires, but I was so delighted that you agreed to be my first guest because we would have all been at your performance opening night at Tanglewood. And we look forward to many, many more performances, uh, not only at Tanglewood, but all over the world. And certainly we'll talk about your new appointment as the music director of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, where we find you now, am I right? Yes, I am in Milwaukee. We've settled here uh, into our new home, our new surrounding. And, uh, you know, we are glad that as a family, we arrived here in January just before the pandemic hit, we certainly hope that all of you are safe and healthy wherever you are. Um, and we are, you know, very thankful that we finished sort of this whole relocation. After last summer, um, we actually took the kids directly from our Tangwood home, uh, kind of surprised them and said, well, look, we're going to be moving to Milwaukee. And since you're having a change, why don't we go on a study trip? So we took them on a study trip to Europe, to Germany, enrolled them in local schools there because we knew, okay, this is never going to happen. And they're uh, 12, 10, and, and 8 now. Uh, and so we had basically five months there. I, I knew that I only had to come to Milwaukee for a few uh, initial uh, sessions to open my uh, season with the orchestra here and in Chicago. And uh, the rest of the time, we basically traveled Europe. And little did we know that now we wouldn't really be able to do that um, for the foreseeable future. So uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, our home in Milwaukee. And I'm very glad to be connected with you this way. Well, we look very forward to hearing a lot more about all of your activities. I know you're building a new concert hall, so we'll talk about that. 
in I'm a happy, bit. Happy to share that. And also, since you mentioned uh, the Chelsea Music Festival, which would have happened um, live the week before uh, the opening concert in Tanglewood, that's also virtual. So we can share with you more information on that because we're actually starting a virtual program with original content and recordings from our first 10 seasons this month uh, in, in a little bit. So I'm happy to share that with you also. Well, I look forward to uh, educating our viewers about the Chelsea Music Festival, which is a collaboration of all of the arts, whether it's visual or culinary, mm, yum, delicious food, <laughs> and the performing arts. And uh, I encourage all of you to come to New York and celebrate this wonderful festival. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Sure. Uh, Ken, you were born in Leipzig. You grew up in a household of musicians. What was that like? Oh, it was, it was wonderful. You know, and the, you know, the actually thinking back, there's, there's a lot that I'm realizing now because I had that, that kind of rich upbringing, which at the time, it just seemed the most natural thing, you know, to have, you know, artists come in and out and you wonder, okay, every week, there's always somebody new coming in, well, this open door policy, if you will, but they were all, you know, later on, uh, as a boy, I didn't know, but later, you, you know, you're told, okay, it was, you know, Klaus Tenstedt, you know, the great conductor, uh, you know, who was friends with my father, other conductors and major soloists, you know, you, you name them, everybody who came through Leipzig and my father would just invite them and my mother, you know, they, they love to host. And uh, all I cared about when I was a little boy then is, is there somebody who's willing to play ping pong with me, you know? So after dinner, <laughs> people actually like Klaus Tenstedt, now that I mentioned it, you know, he was a very competitive type of guy, you know? He, so, so I would go, it's like, yes, sure. But he was very serious with me and I was, you know, a seven year old and I was like, wow, this guy means business. But to have this, I mean, you know, I, I was I was just so fortunate um, to have had that because I didn't have any siblings uh, living in the house anymore. All my other siblings are much older than I am. Uh, the youngest sister next in line, she's 11 years older, Caroline. Um, and so for me to have all these guests coming in and out was amazing. And then to have all that music, we went to concerts regularly. Uh, we would sing a lot at home. Uh, we had, you know, instruments lying around everywhere. My, my mother, um, when I grew up, uh, she was active as an opera singer. She originally, my father and mother met in Rio de Janeiro. She was associate principal viola of the Rio de Janeiro Symphony Orchestra. My father went to guest conduct there and they met and, and fell in love. And uh, she agreed to move to East Germany, which I think at the time was very hard for anyone to <laughs> kind of do <laughs> to behind the Iron Curtain. But she, you know, loved this idea of my gosh, Leipzig, you know, and of course, he he pulled all the cards. He said, you know, my mom's name is Tomoko. Tomoko, why don't you come to Leipzig? It's the town of Bach, you know, it's a where Wagner was born, where Schumann conduct where Mendelssohn was, you know, with Brahms, you know, why don't you come in and, and, and you, know, you can study there, you, you can, you can do other things there. And she's always wanted to be a singer after having grown up playing violin and viola. And so, you know, she at the time was an, an opera singer finishing her studies and then took me to a lot of rehearsals as well. So I grew up hearing uh, rehearsals and performances of Madame Butterfly that she would do or, or other, you know, operas uh, or Bach cantatas, um, you know, with the St. Thomas Choir. So the, growing up in Leipzig was just such a, you were enveloped by, by so many impressions and everything from, from Baroque and, you know, the 800 year old St. Thomas Boys Choir, hearing them regularly in the church to um, the Gewandhaus Orchestra, to, but to also to jazz. And my father had a collection of, of, of a lot of LPs at home and jazz recordings uh, of, you know, Duke Ellington and Stan Kenton and Dave McKenna, you know, who, uh, as Rene knows, um, uh, that was sort of the connection to Boston where I was so happy sitting at the Fairmont Plaza Hotel 
downtown in Boston and finding that connection where my father has sat after his concerts in Boston, listening to Dave McKenna play in the lounge. <laughs> um, and so I was so happy to serve um, as the associate conductor in, in Boston for, for my time there and bringing that together. And as we know now, uh, this, this connection between Leipzig and Boston, which my father, my whole childhood pointed out, there is this close connection not just between the two orchestras, but between the two cities, is now um, featured in the last few years between the two orchestras. So uh, I, I heard that growing up already. And, and so having been part of this, this family and continuing to be part of it was uh, a dream come true, really. So. And, but going back to your childhood, I understand you were a boy soprano and you actually yes. sang in the Gavant House Children's Choir. I think you were nine years old, am I right? Yes, I started. And your, your father was the music director at that time. Yes, uh, and that was really one of the, the biggest influences for me to be part of the children's chorus of the Gewandhaus. Um, of any chorus, you know, at first I remember very distinctly, you know, I spoke about the St. Thomas Boys Choir um, and the very illustrious um, and wonderful uh, cantor who basically was a successor to Johann Sebastian Bach, if you will, um, Roch. He was the uh, cantor in the, you know, at that time until the, I think, early 90s. And uh, my father asked him, and I think I was already about eight years old or seven or eight years old, and, and we had dinner together. And he said, well, what do you think if Ken could audition for you and you know, <laughs> become part of the St. Thomas? Oh, and, and he said immediately over dessert, uh, no, you don't want that for him, you know. <laughs> this is, first of all, he might be a little too old because, you know, some of them start much earlier in the training. But also this is a, he says, this, this is a boarding school. Uh, so, you know, all the boys have to be there. They have to be away from home. It's very rigorous and so on. And of course, they're wonderfully trained, but it's a completely different lifestyle where you're, you're, you're separated from your child quite a bit. Uh, and so he actually discouraged it. And so my father said, okay, uh, but you could be part of the Gewandhaus Children's Chorus, I guess. But that also was an extremely rigorous time. I mean, as eight or nine-year-olds to be treated semi-professionally, have three or four rehearsals a week. Um, and we actually were part of uh, uh, the European uh, choir competition. And uh, I think that we, I think that, two or three years later in the mid 80s, the, the chorus actually won the competition. So they, they found out this is quite an extraordinary chorus that was built there as part of just the Gewandhaus children's chorus. And that allowed um, also my father to do a lot of great repertoire. I mean, we did everything from St. Matthew Passion by memory as nine-year-olds, you know, 10-year-olds. Um, to you know, doing new pieces, uh, new newly commissioned works, or Greek Gint and so so such things, and that still influences me now because um, my father would often say, you know, you hire one able person <clears throat> in an orchestra, who is this gifted educator and communicator in terms of choral arts. Uh, you have all of these families who are invested in their children come in and out of the Gewandhaus, of your concert hall, uh, like revolving doors, and, and they feel this ownership and they're part of the family um, going in and out. So it becomes second nature to them. And, and you only hire this one person who's this educator and you have such a huge impact um, on several generations, not just parents, but grandparents who not just come to your rehearsals, uh, but to your concerts, of course. And you know, it strikes me that that's such an extraordinary experience for a nine-year-old to have, so unusual, certainly in the United States of America, but you were really immersed in a fabulous world of, of music. And did you, were you bit by the bug at that time? Did you know that music was going to be your life and your career? No, I think that, um, uh, you know, for me, what I realized much later on that uh, because I had all of this upbringing and because I, I thought I was completely immersed in music, as you said, 
uh, it, you know, I thought there must be something else out there. So when I, you know, and, and, and I would go on not just to sing, but to play several instruments, study composition when I was in high school and played trumpet and, and piano and, and so on and, uh, and percussion. And uh, I thought there must be something else when I went to Columbia and I, I purposefully did not go to a conservatory, um, <clears throat> even though I had considered it because a lot of the composers that I was working with at the time also said, you know, uh, to, to compose, you don't need to go to conservatory. You need to go somewhere where you can learn about life. And uh, I thought that was very, very good advice. So I ended up, you know, at Columbia University where, yes, you could have a foot in, you know, musical activities, but you really learned about the liberal arts and, and, and also were in contact with, with people who were, had <laughs> ideas to becoming, a, you know, doctors and philosophers and writers and so on. And, and that was, you know, extremely rich to me. But um, ironically, the farther I tried to get away from music or at least find other areas, the more I got pulled back. And I realized I, I can't live without that. So, so I, I attempted, you know, to, to become a, uh, at Columbia University, uh, for those, you know, here who, who are familiar with the curriculum there, there's something, a major called ELAC, East Asian Languages and Cultures, you know, major. Uh, then I studied uh, for some time 19th century uh, French and German literature, uh, you know, tried to do all kinds of other things. And in, during that time, I became music director of the, um, uh, of the Asian uh, orchestra, music director of the contemporary ensemble, music director of the Columbia University Musical Theater Society, uh, and then music director of the Bach Society Chorus and Orchestra. Uh, I was also principal trumpet of the Columbia University uh, Symphony Orchestra. And, and I thought, okay, uh, it clearly, I can't live without music. <laughs> um, I read somewhere that you invited your father, who was music director of the New York Philharmonic at the time, to listen to one of your rehearsals. Well, I, you know, I didn't really invite him because I was much too sensitive and I thought you know that I I don't know what I'm doing but somebody asked me to do a rehearsal I actually refused to this this there was a there was a, a student who approached me uh in the cafeteria I was just getting my mozzarella sticks you know <laughs> and somebody came up behind in my line and said oh I I heard you have a musical background you know we're, we're producing um the opera Dido and Aeneas uh and we're looking for somebody who can conduct. And I said, well, I, I don't know how to do that. I'm sorry, uh, I can't do that. So two weeks later, same person, same cafeteria, you know, <laughs> comes up and said, you know, uh, this weekend is, you, you know, this is when, when, when the first rehearsal happens, you know, we still haven't found anybody. Can't you just do the first rehearsal and then we'll find somebody else? And I said, okay, fine, tell me, tell me where and when. And, and after that rehearsal, you know, I said, okay, I'll do the performances because it was, even though I didn't, in my opinion, didn't really know what I was doing, I, I really enjoyed this process of just exploring the music and um, doing also some, some kind, this music that I wasn't familiar with, which was Baroque, you know, with my father. Yes, we did um, Matthew Passion and the other Passions and a lot of Bach growing up, but Purcell was a whole other arena and was, of course, a little earlier and the style and uh, I thought this was this was fascinating to me. And that kind of led me on this, this path where I didn't feel I, I had to, uh, you know, fulfill expectations. Um, um, and all of this was self-inflicted, you know, expect these, these expectations of having to become a musician or anything. It was just fun to be with peers um, and doing, doing a, a project together. And as part of that, I just told my father, hey, somebody asked me to do this, this thing. And, and I had lunch with him and he was, he typically would 
drive me home on his way, you know, home uh, where where we lived uh, north of of Manhattan. And uh, he said, "Well, I yeah, I can drop you off, and 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 if you want, I can also listen in for half an hour." And he said, "No, no, no, it's okay. You know, people are gonna get scared when they see you." He's like, "Okay, okay, just start the rehearsal, and I'll sneak in the back." <laughs> And so he did. And so he, you know, he snuck in and in the, in the back. And after, afterwards, he just said very calmly, you know, uh, you can, I, I really enjoyed that. You know, it's, it seems you enjoy that. I, I enjoyed that. That, that was, was great. What, what you did. And I said, well, no, it was, it wasn't good, but you know, tell me if, if you, you know, if I can do something better. So uh from that point on you know he was very i'm very thankful for that because he was very sensitive because i was a sensitive kind of guy and and certainly not interested in in doing what he did so well um you know it, it's very interesting because many people in your situation would would be somewhat intimidated or really living in the shadow of such a renowned conductor and yet you seem that he was supportive and, and loving and caring and uh, how special, how special yeah. that must have been for you. Yeah, and I, I'm glad that I realized at least after the fact, you know, in the moment uh, you don't, you, you, you get somewhat, as you said, you know, perhaps uh, uh, self-conscious and so on. And, you know, but, but I'm glad that I had moments where I could tell him, you know, the way you handled that was very good. <laughs> and the, the way I felt supported, but not pushed uh, at all, allowed me to, you know, go in that direction, uh, very slowly and very cautiously, because I had such great respect for what it is that he had done. And also, you know, other members in my family who've been in music. So you know, one of my greatest influences uh, was my grandmother, who was a pianist and a piano teacher in, in Tokyo, and other members of my family who are who are in music. And I never thought of myself as good enough or or able to even you know come close to understanding what it means to be in that profession. And that kind of helped me to both have uh, a healthy amount of humility and respect for for the profession and what it takes, but at the other, on the other hand, this desire to really want to learn more about it. Uh, and I'm glad that I had that experience of that balance. When you were growing up, at some point, you auditioned and were accepted for the BUTI program. Yes. Did you, were you a singer? Did you play an instrument? What was your major? I, I was accepted as a composer. As a composer? Yeah. Interesting. So I did yeah, I did the composition program. That was really at that time when I was in high school, one of the directions I wanted to go into. I, I composed a lot. I, you know, for mostly actually, you know, I, I, I wrote musicals and rock operas and uh, nothing fancy classical, if you will, you know, um, learning about, uh, arrangements and orchestration and and things i had written things early on you know writing songs and so on but i learned about that because uh for our school i always had to write for the instruments that were available so i wanted to learn how to how to do that and incorporate all of the the musicians and it was a uh, you know the german international school that it's now called north of manhattan uh, is quite small. You don't have, uh, as your typical high school, you know, a thousand students. We, we had 14 kids in my grade level. <laughs> so um, it was much smaller, but many of them played instruments, but uh, you didn't have your equal balance between string players and, and wind players or percussion. And uh, so that was interesting to me. And that's for me, beauty. I was uh, something that was one of the key moments, I think, in, even though that happened the year before uh, I, I entered college and all these things that we just talked about happened then. So, but it was in that time frame of two to three years that a lot of intense impressions 
uh, I was exposed to really influenced me. And BUTI uh, was this, oh my goodness, uh, you know, before I got dropped off, you know, I said, you know, I, I had this stack of flashcards uh, for music theory, you know, and I would ask my, my mother and my aunt was there visiting in the car. And I said, ask me, ask me, you know, because all these kids that, that go to this program, you know, they know so much about music. I need to know this stuff. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, uh, BUTI stands for Boston University Tanglewood Institute. And it's the training program for high school students. Again, highly selective. Not everyone gets in, but it does happen every summer. And uh, how exciting that you were part of that. Was it your first time at Tanglewood, Ken? No, it I had come to Tanglewood uh, with, you know, with my parents many times. And in fact, Tanglewood really was, or is, I should say, um, the second home uh, after sort of this, if you will, this feeling of home, musical home that, that was Leipzig to me. You know, the, 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 the memories and the impressions from, from my early childhood, um, Tanglewood, has a major part in that. I remember going there as a, you know, five-year-old, you know, from, a, from basically from, from early childhood on, um, you know, encounters with, you know, uh, people like Seiji, you know, Seiji backstage, uh, you know, and, and even as a BUTI student, you know, all these impressions, you know, it kind of led up to that. So for me, I think I put more pressure and also excitement, sort of this anticipation uh, for the BUTI summer because I knew about Tanglewood. I knew the place that it was and what, what amazing music had been made there. And I told myself, if I get the opportunity to spend a summer there as an active participant, which this was the first time you felt like, okay, here now, here, here are here's one set of the keys, you know, to, to participate um, in, in some way, then I wanted to really be, be at my most alert. And, you know, since then, this is one of the reasons why both my wife, Melinda, uh, who is um, the director of piano chamber music for the BOTI program there now, and, and, you know, I've done the, the program there uh, for several years as well with the, the orchestra. And so we feel so connected, but we also understand that what these students are going through at this time, um, they're still processing for years to come because I am still thinking back on, on moments and, and memories for, for that very intense time you know, a few weeks there, what, what you learn in a few weeks and almost everybody who's go gone to, through that program will tell you it's like a lifetime of, of, of learning, you know, compressed into this one summer for, for many. And uh, so we are, we're fortunate to have, have that and, and make sure that that connection stays alive, yeah. Do you remember who some of your composition teachers were at that time? Yes, Dr. Cornell who was the director of the composition program. He was also an interim dean of the music department at BU at the time. Um, we had several visiting guest artists um, and I think it was Louis Andreessen and then Kevin Putz, who, uh, you know, I, I love his music and, um, you know, he was one of those um, teachers and I think he was at the time at Eastman as well. I visited Eastman as part of my process of um, deciding whether to go to conservatory or, or university uh, program. He was uh, there for that. Um, several others. Oh, and that summer I also met, I had, a, I had this really life-changing encounter with John Williams um, in the staircase as for those of you who've been there um, at the, um, um, the uh, mansion. Oh my gosh, now I forgot the name. Highwood? Hi Highwood. Highwood. Uh, at Highwood. And oh, yeah. I, was, I was upstairs in one of the, um, you know, rooms just writing some music. And 
as I was about to leave, John Williams comes in and we met in that staircase. And I just, and nobody else around, no, no one else. Uh, it was completely empty otherwise. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, hi. Sometimes I don't say anything, you know, I, I don't want to disturb anyone. But I said, oh, hello, Mr. Williams. It's so nice to see you here. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually studying composition at UTI. And he's like, oh, wonderful. So what are you doing now? You know, he was just, you're, what we know of John Williams, you know, he was, he was that, he was that in that moment. And um, now that he and I have become good friends and he's been so supportive of me and um, he actually is also going to come and help us open the hall here in Milwaukee. And he's come to my debuts, uh, not just in Boston, but even in LA when I went first to the Hollywood Bowl, he was there. And uh, I, tell him all the time that this first encounter for me was so encouraging and, and quite wonderful. Uh, and, you know, we've had many of these types of encounters in, in Tanglewood for sure. And I'm uh, reminded of just that place at the top of those stairs at Highwood where he composed a piece uh, about a ghost, the ghost of Highwood. So I remember that quite well, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So going on with your career, you became uh, a conducting fellow at the Tanglewood Music Center in 2011, and you made your debut with the Boston Symphony at Tanglewood in July of 2012 with your father. And that was in a program where you shared conducting responsibilities. What was that like? Oh, it was, you know, it was wonderful. I mean, for I just felt so privileged and, and, you know, grateful. First of all, I think what people should know is that um, it was hard for me to agree to do that uh, because, you know, typically I would always say, of course not. You know, I'm just a student. I'm a fellow. That was my second. I wasn't an, an assistant conductor yet. It was my second summer as a fellow. My fellowship, my, uh, you know, I was so proud, as I told you, this uh, Seiji was, was one of the idols growing up and I, I revered him. Uh, and to be given the Seiji Ozawa conducting fellowship uh, in 2011 was, was such a, uh, a privilege and, and a wonderful thing for me and encouragement. And I learned so much that first summer uh, my father would visit um, as well, and I think he was actually a, a guest um, artist in, in the program as well. So, you know, for us to be able to spend those summers together there, especially as I'm studying, was, was great. And in 2012, that instance of us sharing, I think, for, for those people who don't know, my father was diagnosed um, a couple of years earlier with the onset of Parkinson's disease. And uh, so ever since, and I was studying actually after my time in, in New York at Columbia, I went on to study uh, in Germany. So Malin and I, she was enrolled in Hanover and I was uh, in Berlin studying there for four or five years until 2007. Um, and that was around that time is actually when, when my father found out. And he was at the time working a lot in London with the uh, London Philharmonic and in Paris. And um, Melinda, my wife, she told me, you know, you don't know how long you're going to uh, have your father around, you know, especially knowing that he's going through this, um, uh, the Parkinson's and, and, you know, for us not really knowing much about it. And he, he was struggling with, with some, some health issues. And so for me to just have this mindset before I wanted to just kind of go my own way. And now it was about me trying to spend as much time as I could with my father, um, you know, in that period from 2008 on was kind of a wonderful uh, change in my mind of, of just being there and connecting. And 
So I'm so grateful that I had that time. And so as part of that, that's when, you know, in 2011 and 12, he had uh, a couple of falls. Um, and, you know, we didn't know if he would be able to get back and so on. And this concert was sort of his, after a few months of recovery from one of his falls, um, was was the hope of kind of his comeback, you know, onto the stage. And so this concert um, in 2012, they already knew and, you know, um, Tony Fogg uh, with the BSO and, and everybody knew, okay, Ken is going to come back as a fellow. And my father said, I'm not sure that I can conduct a full program just physically. Um, and then they, you know, approached me cautiously, my father both and, and, and Tony with this idea, well, would you mind sharing this program um, with your father? And, and I said, mm, I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I can do that. But at the same time, I wanted it to happen. I wanted to support my, my dad as well. And, and I wanted him to be able to do that. And um, they were very kind in the, the way they, they made the encouragement. Uh, and I, you know, finally just said, okay, let's, let's do it. And then of course it became a very joyful for me, a nerve wracking occasion, but a joyful occasion. And for him to see him also feel supported by me, that was very special. Um, and so I didn't, <laughs> Tony, <laughs> Tony did something very funny for those of you who know Tony Fogg, you know, I, I, I owe a great debt to, to him and, and the wonderful ways in which he's built me up and given me opportunities through the Boston Symphony and at Tanglewood. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, I have to start the concert, um, this concert in, in July 2012, and I'm in, in the dressing room where all the greats have been, and I'm there and I'm, I'm thinking, what am I doing here? You know, I'm just a student, I'm just a fellow. Uh, and I have to start this concert. Uh, and Tony just comes by and he says, you know, not, you know, all the very best can, and, you know, uh, no, the first things that come out of his mouth are, you know, Ken, uh, you only make your debut once. <laughs> it better be good. And it was. It, it better it be was. good. I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for this extra pressure. I really didn't need that. <laughs> no, but, but, I, I knew that it was also uh, an encouragement and sort of for him this 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 joy and and this excitement and and his his show of support of that he's you know he knows that I can do it and so it it was really a wonderful occasion in the end yes wonderful well we're thrilled for you and moving forward in 2019 you became the music director of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra preceded by the great Edo Devort. Uh, how exciting that must be for you. And you're building a new concert hall. So I hope you tell us about that as well. I understand that you moved a huge wall in order to build what will become the Bradley Center. Yes. So, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, you know, becoming music director here in Milwaukee is, is really wonderful during this time. And even with everything that is going on, um, or maybe even especially, you know, I think that we as, as musicians and people in the creative arts, you, know, you, you always think through creatively of how to deal with the most challenging of times. Um, and certainly these are the most challenging that I have seen in my lifetime. Um, but we are realizing while that is happening, there are other people who have seen much more challenging times, right? So just, you know, having this opportunity to relate to that and then to also think about, okay, with all of the pandemic and the protests and the social awareness and social justice things that are going on, how, how does a concert hall um, fit into this? And I told you earlier in our conversation about the Gewand House and the building. What I haven't told you is that really for me, as soon as I found out about this position, I, you know, I'm looking for the musicians here are absolutely wonderful. The orchestra is fantastic. Um, and I've had already some of the most memorable um, experiences musically um, 
here uh, with with them and so i'm very fortunate i'm very much looking forward to this time and the the concert hall um that i think is going to be extraordinary um actually the acoustician um here is scarborough who also did you know severance hall in cleveland nashville <clears throat> is now going to be part uh in new york as well and he talked to me and he said this is one of the most unique halls that's going to be here in, in, Nor in North America, um, acoustically also. So we hope that some of you might be able to, to visit. So both, not just visually, but more importantly, of course, acoustically, I think this hall is going to be extraordinary. So we have those plans. Um, but at the same time, with the significance of what the, the Gewandhaus building um, did for me, and I just want to quickly uh, uh, ex explain that because it's it's important to me to talk about really what is a concert hall, you know, in principle, and everybody comes in with a different association have, because it depends on your 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 own um, childhood experiences that you're influenced by, and and I'm grateful that the the meaning for me is really not just a space for entertainment. Um, and, you know, concerts and so on, but it is in, in the situation that the, the, the world found itself in Germany and the people uh, in 89, the new hall had only been open for eight years and you had all of these <clears throat> protests and unrests starting in 88, actually started by a pastor who just wanted to do peace prayers and his congregation would walk around the city center uh, and that would get larger and more people would you know, have courage to actually speak up um, about things that they found um, were not working um, you know, in the government and in the city. And uh, people started gravitating towards those that they trusted most, of course. And they were not the politicians. They were not the civic leaders. They were um, the musicians, the artists, some of the spiritual leaders that they could trust. And as part of that movement, the concert hall, the Gewandhaus became sort of an embassy. It also was the first place or part of three venues where freedom of speech in 1989 was first exercised in East Germany. So after the peaceful demonstration where um, no shots were fired, even though the city was surrounded, um, the, the conversation had, had to continue. And of course, as I'm talking, um, many people realize I, I see very, very big parallels to this experience and what, what is happening here in this country now. Um, that you have unrest, you have protests, but ultimately the conversations have to continue. And this is what the Gewandhaus became uh, a, a major part of because people felt the most comforted and safe to be able to speak their mind and also have constructive conversations. So I would imagine then that the role of music director is a lot more than just being a conductor. Oh, I'd I like to think so. Um, you know, coming out of our comfort zone. And if we, if we realize, and this is something that I've told even the BUTI students, you know, coming through Tanglewood, when, when you come into a space that is as rich as Tanglewood and you are given the privilege of so much information and so much, um, uh, you know, understanding how to create beauty uh, with not just your instrument, but how you can get a, attention, right? The privilege of attention. You are also automatically given responsibility to use that, that voice. Um, it is a big privilege when you, you play an instrument beautifully, even on the street, right? When we go and we pass or somebody is, is practicing and you hear music out the window, when it's beautiful, you, 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 you stay, you, you, you stand there and you're like, oh, this is, this is beautiful. This, this privilege of having given this attention and this voice, how do we use that? And I had a conversation with the director of the Beethoven house in Bonn 
about Global Environmental Day, which is part of their pastoral project, which started June 5th. And Yo-Yo Ma and I, you know, we, we became part of the first 50 signees of this. And we talked about how uh, it is important for us to speak out about these issues and not just be entertainers um, who create beautiful music that has nothing to do with our current situation and the things that we we want us to connect as as human beings um, in this world so you know this for me is the importance of bringing awareness to as part of a concert hall um, and in milwaukee some of you who are familiar with this area between milwaukee and chicago you have uh some of the the most segregated areas and cities in the country where a lot of these things have to be addressed and i don't think it should be separated from what happens in the concert hall there should be a safe and constructive dialogue with the music because the music is what's able to break down uh sort of this 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 conflict and we have uh, a tool that helps us confront difficult subjects and topics so the dialogue needs to happen in places where people feel safe and i certainly feel that concert halls have the responsibility to be that place well we're very excited and certainly milwaukee is extremely fortunate to have you in the city leading the orchestra and i know it's going to be incredibly successful and lucrative and happy time for you and your family uh, as a conductor it's always fascinated me as to how conductors uh, practice. The orchestra is your instrument. How do you learn a score? Yeah, <laughs> especially now, you know, it's interesting now that we are not rehearsing and also for the foreseeable future, unable to rehearse as such. You're absolutely right. All of the orchestra musicians are practicing their instruments now, they still can as they usually do before we come together. And I typically sit right here at the desk and uh, look over some scores. Um, and, you know, I've learned to hear the parts and the music in my mind. Uh, and, you know, I, I try to play some instruments, keyboards and with the children and so on. But you're right, uh, in terms of practicing to hear, of course, there's nothing like being actually in the midst and in front of the orchestra and being able to, to react to what you hear in the room. Live music can never be um, replicated, you know, uh, and canned, if you will. Uh, of course, it has to be this breathing organism because that's really dialogue, right? We are, we're listening, we're listening intently and we react to, to that, we don't dictate. So it's, uh, yeah, from what, what is in your mind to what comes out, it's important. But you've also started kind of touching on something that is, when I'm teaching, you know, now uh, students who would like to conduct or even people just in, in terms of chamber music groups, this idea of us spending time and hearing things in our mind as we, as we read the music um, you, you come prepared with a certain sound that, that you have. And at the same time, you know, that, that this combination of what you have, uh, prepared in your mind and what is actually happening once you give a downbeat to the orchestra, uh, has to somehow mesh, you know, um, this, this idea of, for me at least, and, and conductors have to make um, this decision. How much of what you had in your mind do you want to try to get the orchestra to do? Uh, some call it, if it's, if it's too authoritarian, you know, how much do you want to impose, right? When it's really not something that the orchestra sounds like. And how much do you want the orchestra sound to re really flourish and the ideas and the musicianship that's there to come out uh, and you kind of add your reaction to it. Well, you can imagine that with an orchestra like the Boston Symphony and even with the Milwaukee Symphony, who are all 
extremely musical and, and highly trained and world-class musicians that really my job is to hear what is what is the sound what is the dna of this this extraordinary instrument just as if we would go to a piano and and we say oh this looks wonderful let's see what it sounds like boom <laughs> what is the the soul of this instrument and if you can somehow find a way to let it speak without losing its identity that's 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 basically the beauty of of uh, at least my my job how i see it you know, I read somewhere that the conductor Charles Munch said that the right hand draws and the left hand colors. What oh, do you think about yes. that? Yes, uh, right. I, uh, well, Munch, absolutely. I think that, you know, he comes from a very uh, cultivated and uh, uh, interesting school, um, of course, of thought. And, and, you know, this, the idea of sort of the baton hand Right, the baton hand having this very, um, uh, very what do you call it, directing, you know, uh, idea. But also in terms of knowing at the tip of your baton where it is and and sort of what it can do, and people watching that, right? And then the left hand showing, uh, you know, the expression and so on. Certainly, that's still something that that works uh, very much. For me, um, I, I would say that I have oftentimes the, uh, the, the decision you know, quite late before a concert even starts of, uh, am I going to use a baton for this piece or am I, am I going to go baton less? And Your father did not use a baton. Did he, that influence you? So yes, however, here's what's very interesting. Um, I, I had never seen a live concert of my father using a baton, but before I was born, he did use a baton um, because he was an opera conductor. You know, he went through that school. He was very, very good technically with his baton. And there are old recordings of him using a baton and uh, of using, uh, you know, uh, operas, uh, even Beethoven symphonies in Dresden with the Philharmonic. Um, and then he had an accident, a car accident that oh. didn't allow him really to, he said it, it would hurt him after a while. And he had to learn, you know, in the 60s to, to, to go without. But that's what I grew up with. That's all I remembered, of course. And when Do I you have a, I'm sorry, I was just curious about whether you have a baton which is specially made for you, do you prefer cork? Tell us about your baton. Oh, uh, well, uh, now that you made, I, I'm not prepared. We didn't prepare this, but <laughs> okay. I actually, well, I haven't taken these out in a while. Uh, let's see now. So, uh, I hope this is not boring to you. Uh, but uh, so, so this is sort of how I wow. how I keep them, um, and this um, was how batons that I had ordered from Alan Pierce, who is in Oregon, um, who has made batons for uh, many conductors. Let me see what else is in here. Well, these are my sort of regular, you know, corked batons, but you can get these. They're quite long, but you can get these uh, even online. These are not specially made, but I'm trying to find some that were specially made because I also have my initials uh, in them. Oh. And I saw that from one of my uh, Finnish friend colleagues, Hannu Lintu, who, wonderful Finnish conductor who um, had these, and I, he's, he was the first conductor I saw um, with it. Um, and he showed me that. But meanwhile, while I'm looking for that, I'm showing you um, batons that the great bow maker, who is also taught at Tanglewood and who makes bows for Yo-Yo and for Anne-Sophie, Benoit Roland, who lives now in Boston. You know, he moved there with his wife and they're wonderful. He has made these batons for me. And they have... Wow. This 
actually this is um varnish from a cadillac that he researched so this is the same as what is used on a cadillac and you see his name on there benoit roland um and and it's very ergonomic you know in in your hand and even when you sweat you know it's quite beautiful and and there's another one here that he made with oh, this blue beautiful. varnish and he, and so i've used these a number of times uh, as well um and and you know there is something very special about the kind of sound you get because one of the most important less first lessons i learned from my father is orchestra musicians will play what they see and of course what they sense coming from you in terms of your energy um but ultimately when you do show something especially with an orchestra like the boston symphony they can see everything sense everything and you know if you show something that you didn't want well that's your fault <laughs> you know? uh, they will they will be able to do that and so you have to be very uh, clear and clean and uh and so these you know batons become part of you know you're an extension of you are there certain motions that a conductor will indicate uh strength or tranquility uh when you study um, conducting classes how do you indicate emotions how do you communicate you you can't speak how do you use your eyes or your face well exactly what what you just said eyes and face very very important you know this you can tell you know i mean it's it's like we're in in a conversation you know and if i'm trying to draw you in and tell you i have something i have a secret to tell you you know uh, your eyes have that expression it's like something special is about to happen and this is how I look at, you know, the, the musicians, uh, because that's what the music is making me feel. Or, you know, something, you want something bold, you know, or something light, you know, or something humorous. And, and very much, very often, it ha does have to do with your eyes and not just with, you know, all of, all of this, the technicality. But it's, as I said earlier, sort of this what character you emit because for me it's about storytelling and the character that you want uh that you want the music to have and for us to to get that range you 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 want you know i i wanted to grow in that sense that i knew that i had to grow uh in that regard uh for you know for for the sounds to come out the way they are and a forte which is you know as as many people say in, in music, uh, uh, loud. But for me, forte and and as you know, it, in in Italian, it just means strong. There's different kinds of showing strength in terms of sound. Uh, there's a thousand different ways that a forte can sound, uh, and a thousand different ways a piano can sound. Um, you know, to to have something hushed and soft. So, for me, it's yeah, it's it's through your being. Um, and also that the other thing that, that is important that we as conductors sometimes uh, can get in the way. So the, the job is to be there, to not distract from the music, um, but to really embody it and, and allow for the music to speak without us being in the way or also using extraneous motions that really have nothing to do with it, you know, as, as some would say, are too showy. <laughs> my you know, I've all... this... mm -hmm. oh, Go ahead. My father had this, this, this thought that he, he said, and I, I would go often as a boy to his master classes and, you know, I remember a lot of the phrases he would use, but he said, if, if you're sweating more than the musicians, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Are there conductors that you particularly admire today? Oh, many. I mean, you know, I think in our profession, we, I would hope that we continue to look at, uh, at, at each other and how, how others are able to draw uh, a certain, a, spe a special sound, right? Um, 
some physically, some just by the way in which they can use the few words you want to use to really get a certain sound and an expression or a mood without saying too much. Um, and, you know, you have a, a, a wide range of spectrum. You have, uh, and even from the, the panelists that uh, you're going to be having on, some of the guests, uh, you know, Stefan Dunev, um, he, you know, is, is, uh, has wonderful ideas. I've learned so much, especially from him in terms of the French repertoire. You know, I've learned uh, even in, in Tangwood and all, all the times when he talks about it. He, but he does tell you a lot of stories about certain piece because he's very passionate about sharing that the background and, and all of that. So he uses his his words, but it's it's with with really interesting information. Uh, that's you know one one style, and he has his own. And then you have, on the other hand, uh, someone like Heitink, who who comes and and the beat as you know also loves him very much, and he doesn't say very much at all um you know he, he goes through it he doesn't talk about music too much it's just he shows it and uh and it sounds extraordinary beautiful um so ken david i was wondering tell tell us if you will about the relationship between soloist and conductor how do you communicate with each other during a concerto so, yes, soloists, you know, I find uh, my job is to find out what is, what are the intentions? First, when you get an opportunity even to sit, you know, I, uh, I love to, to just sit with the soloist before a rehearsal and the performance. Um, to talk to them about the piece. Sometimes they play for me. Sometimes it's just even talking through the piece. You get a sense of what is the story and with what character do they want to tell it. Uh, and so I become a medium, if you will, a, a transistor between <laughs> the, the intention of the pianist, and I'm talking now about, you know, of the great pianists or the, the great uh, violinists and cellists and, and other soloists and singers that we work with who, who come with this extraordinary idea and, you know, um, and you, you become a conduit and try to emit that energy to, to the orchestra. And so that there is a, a mixing of the characters. Um, but it's also a dialogue in that you do want to make sure, okay, where are we going in the big picture? What is our goal? Um, building this, let's say, up this concerto or this movement. And, uh, you know, what is, what is our destination? Uh, how soft do we want it? You know, or what is this transition? How much time do you need? How much breath do you want? How much air? And so... Uh, for me, it's this, it is a dialogue of, of give and take and, um, but ultimately really finding out or at least encouraging for, let's say, a young soloist who has never performed with an orchestra before to encourage them to ask those questions. What do you really want? And also look at a score and know, you know, what's happening when you're playing here. Okay, who are you accompanying? Sometimes we have in concertos a, a, an oboe solo and the piano is playing and the, the pianists don't know that it, that's an oboe because they only played it with another piano. And so they just keep going and nobody can hear the oboe. Yeah, just these kinds of uh, little things, depending on, on the, uh, the level of, you know, of, of maturity, of course. So it's really a true collaboration. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, uh, I will tell you that we have some questions from our audience. Um, sure. I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Megan Wilden, in a moment. But I want to tell you what a joy it's been to talk with you. Uh, and uh, please do give my very warmest regards to your wife and your beautiful three children who I love dearly. So oh. thank you very, very much, Ken David. Uh, we wish you all the best in your career and in your personal happiness. And we hope to see you at Tanglewood and other venues around the world very, very soon. 
I hope to see you all also and all the best to you as well. Thanks, Renee. You're hey, very Renee, welcome. You can, you can stay stay on for sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. We'll do so. Um, so we have lots of great questions and also comments. Lots of love for this conversation. Uh, Terry Weaver says, fascinating, engaging, and informative, and says he used to be a, a neighbor of Booty and always enjoyed eavesdropping. Ah, <laughs> very good. And then uh, Francis asks, what are some of the obstacles in having contemporary music scores performed after their world premiere? How can they become part of the standard repertory? Oh, very good question. Uh, thank you for that. I think we, you know, if we can, especially in, in, in the current climate that, that, that we find ourselves in, you know, I, I guess I can maybe make a blanket statement that we all have biases towards something. We, we are more comforted by certain things and less comforted and familiar by others, right? All, all of us do. And the hope is that with, with the opportunities we're given with music and everything and programming, that we can make people understand it's really ultimately about building a relationship of trust that you know, if, if you have good friends, for those of you, you know, who've spent times and, 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 and you're more willing to go to someplace new or try new food when you're with a good friend, because like, oh, if it's not for me, at least I've experienced it with my good friend, right? And, and we would like the music to, to help us to bridge that. And with, with contemporary music, it's it's one thing, and, and, and I'm kind of going around the, the back with this uh, answer, is to first, this first encounter to contemporary music is one thing, you know, um, making that happen and commissioning, and which is exciting always. Um, and the ultimate thing is, as, as performers and the musicians will tell you often, uh, we need to be convinced that this is a voice that needs to be heard, not just one time, but multiple times, and not just as a token, um, but something that we want to be part of the, the greater conversation. Um, and so to get repeat performances of something, it shouldn't be just part of how successful was it or how, how much clapping was there. A lot of works that we play now in the regular repertoire, doesn't matter if it's from the 18th or 19th centuries, a lot of that music didn't, was not successful when it was first heard. And a lot of the music had to wait way too long to be performed again. Um, and so the, 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 the main thing is, is for us to create opportunities for music to have at least a second or third time. And it's already happening that uh, out of that necessity and that wish that um, there are a lot of co-commissioning projects. So instead of having one orchestra commission one piece, that only gets performed at one time, and if it's not good, it's forgotten, that at least you have three or four or five orchestras or chamber societies or ensembles, organizations who are co-commissionees, and that means that piece will go around these different places and have at least a series of, of performances, and also the performers have more of an opportunity to really um, wrap their their head around it and and you know really uh, uh, invest in it and 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 um, deliver it in in a way that is authentic and very very striking uh, and then you can always decide okay is this uh, either a composer or a piece that should you know should be part of the conversation um, I will. It looks like you froze. Is that what you see, Renee? Yes, I think I so. He's, he's unfrozen. He just yeah. froze for a sec. Oh, okay. Um, can you can you hear me now? Yep. All good. Yeah. So so you know f it, the idea is that 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 there's a continuation of of this music flowing out and then allowing for for uh, you know second, third, and fourth performances but at the same time we want to make sure that there's a good balance because we want as many people to give us as, as much uh, uh, you know support and opportunity and platforms for composers that and there are many out there 
that ought to be heard. And, and uh, as one organization, you can only do so much. Uh, you know, some orchestras uh, only have the capacity to commission one or two pieces a year. Uh, what do you do then? Well, then you can, of course, go back to other pieces, perhaps that have not been performed much, and that that way, you know, in terms of budget and so thing, such things, you can do repeat performances. But ultimately, really, you want the performers to really feel invested in it, so that it can be performed. A lot of the pieces that we have in the regular repertoire now didn't uh, find their way into the standard repertoire because the performances were. The, the music was given to the performers probably a day in advance and it ended up not being <laughs> very successful. You know, we, I talked with Augustine Hadelich about the Beethoven Violin Concerto, which at your first performance must have been horrendous, you know, uh, hard to believe. But uh, some pieces like that where we thought, oh, these, how can they not have been popular at first? And, and I think uh, with contemporary music, it's important for us to to keep that as part of, let's say, the menu. As Renee said, uh, we often like to think in culinary terms. And I do think that programming very much is like a balanced uh, menu that should have something new and exciting, new tastes, new colors. Uh, and, and to me, that's important to be, have part of the programming process. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Carl Schuster. He asks, what major work will you choose to program for the glorious opening of the new concert hall in Milwaukee? Well, ha, thank <laughs> you for that, Carl. Uh, you know, our program was going to be uh, a commissioned work by Eric Nathan, who many of you are familiar with because uh, he, as you know, has also just written the concerto basically for orchestra for the Boston Symphony that they opened their season with. Um, I'm, you know, a close friend and, and we've actually worked with, with him. Uh, he, he and I were actually fellows together um, at Tanglewood. Um, and so we've gotten to know each other that way. And then Melinda and I invited him to New York for the Chelsea Music Festival. He became a composer in residence. So we were very familiar with his work. So um, he's a fantastic composer and we commissioned a work for him to, to write for the opening as well. So that would have been an Eric Nathan first piece, then um, the concerto for string quartet uh, and orchestra by John Adams. And uh, on the second half, Beethoven Ninth Symphony, because we wanted to have uh, a choral work, a major choral work, um, because we have a great um, symphony chorus here in Milwaukee um, to include them in that. And of course, we're still in Beethoven year. So uh, also the John Adams piece has references to Beethoven. So you have basically, you go from two American composers, you know, <laughs> kind of in this form to, to Beethoven. That was the original program, but as you know, uh, very unlikely that uh, we would be able to gather with that large apparatus, uh, uh, you know, with the orchestra and also with choirs, uh, the difficulty of choirs coming together. So we are currently thinking about how are we going to uh, not just start this season. That's one thing. A lot of, as you know, orchestras have, um, uh, you know, kind of moved their season opening to a beginning of next year, January. Some orchestras, unfortunately, have completely closed down. We hope not to do that. We will have uh, programming um, similar to, I think, what the BSO is doing with, you know, chamber ensembles and, and, and depending on what the situation is, probably have kind of fluid programming um, that way and at some point maybe morph into something larger. So we cannot plan for this big thing. But um, this, uh, you know, which was also supposed to be broadcast this opening because of the new hall uh, is going to be reevaluated of course because we we don't want the soft opening there there are two at least generations of um, residents here in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin greater Wisconsin that have waited to see this hall because this is a 1930 building um, that is transformed now into this concert hall and a lot of people have watched 
you know, their, their favorite classic movies here for the first time when they open. You know, it's, it's one of those very grand theaters that's now being redone. And so we want to make sure that people have an opportunity to really uh, experience it in, in a grand style. So at least now you know what our original plan was, but we, we have to see what percentage we can realize. It's a time in our lives where we have to be very flexible and yes. adapt to circumstances. So Pam Cohen writes, thank you so much, Maestro Mazur, for sharing your fascinating life stories with us. My question is, are you concerned for the future of classical music in the U.S., and what more can we do to maintain interest in the younger generation? Wonderful question. Thank you so much. Um, I am not concerned uh, for classical music at all. Um, however, having said that, for me, it's clear that classical music is like a stream of, of life-giving water. It will always find a way through, not just through the darkest times, but the biggest cynists, you know, cynical uh, uh, times and people who uh, have, have no understanding of what music can do um, in people's lives. And uh, you also mentioned, you know, sort of the younger generation education, which I think is the most important. Uh, the younger you start with, with giving children and you know everyone the opportunity and this is part of this movement that's that's going on now the conversations about um, social justice and opportunity and equity uh, that orchestras are having which is super important um, to me and in fact actually for those of you who are interested to find out more about what what our work is here uh, I, am, I actually have a weekly podcast um, with the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. And last week's episode and this week's episode are with Yo-Yo Ma and other educators in, in the community where we talk about this topic of, you know, education and moving forward and how do we relate music to one another. So if you're interested in that, you can, it's on the Milwaukee Symphony MSO.org website. I've done now 15 or 16 episodes with various topics. And the idea is about bringing awareness to them early on before they have preconceived notions about or, or bad associations with, with music, right? We want to create good and peaceful and, 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 and joyful associations with what music can bring to them and that it's not reserved for a select group of people or, um, you know, a, a, a select group of cult people with cultural backgrounds, right? We want to make sure that that's available to, to everyone. And so, you know, I, while I'm not concerned for classical music, it's clear to me that uh, the avenues and, and we have work to do in terms of bringing more uh, music, making it available because the, the politics are not doing it. You know, the advocacy is only going a certain direction. Uh, but Mark Volpe says, of, you know, it's about advocacy. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying we still have that avenue, even though it's not always successful. I mean, look at this. You have, and I like to give this, this example. In March, when it was clear that we we're going to go through this pandemic, um, in early April, Angela Merkel in Germany signed a 50 billion uh, euro uh, bill to support arts organizations and music with the words arts and music is the most important at this time for us to 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 keep our mental health to to keep sane and for us to build us up and encourage us that's the most important so here you go arts organizations 50 million um, and now they've actually given more I have not seen that come from our leadership here, clearly. Um, and so both at you know, the federal level and uh, the state level, um, what you need is people, and I should say this, Angela Merkel, she uh, and Melinda and, and her trio actually performed for her. She was uh, an honoree in New York when she came uh, at the Leo Beck Institute, Center for Jewish History, um, and was given the Leo Beck Medal and she knows her music and she enjoys the music. She has an understanding for it. We have a lot of leaders in our communities 
that are understanding for the because they have a, a, a they've been in touch with the arts or with music and they have that relationship so we wish it to everyone because we know that there are going to be better leaders out there who are able to listen and yo-yo when i had this conversation with him he said our job as musicians and teaching you know to others is first to listen before we make a sound ourselves first to listen and you know that is that is true leadership isn't it and so if we can help m music send that message and have people understand and and experience that from an early stage on that's that's the wonder and that you know we might not see it in our lifetime come to fruition but it's it's a, an investment worth making because uh, it's it's always underestimated and i think uh you know, just talk, talking about that, creating in our own communities, because the big picture is always overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And the consensus is, let's not get overwhelmed, but let's understand that we do have uh, platforms in within our own circles uh, to have that impact and um, to look for opportunities where we can support music education or just bringing music into people's homes or encourage, as I say, uh, parents or grandparents to sing to their kids is actually the, the easiest thing to do. We all have a voice, we all have a song and for them to feel comforted through a song, um, babies, newborns and one or two year olds, they're, they're not going to protest. Yes, if they're six, seven, eight years old and they've never been exposed to a song or you singing, they're going to be like, what are you doing? That's weird, stop that. <laughs> but if you can start when they're young they're going to be like oh sing me another one you know and then you've already created a relationship um you know within your own small circle bravo bravo Beautiful. yes and right here in the berkshires i'm happy to say we have a uh, el sistema inspired program called kids for harmony uh that is um training and bringing up a new generation of classical musicians um, that's great it's really exciting well yeah. the time has just flown um i just want to read a couple of we were not able to get to all the questions but i just <laughs> want to read a few comments uh linda samble said what a wonderful privilege this has been thank you all deb cole duffy says in this exquisite interview with ms rhoda mr mazur wove the beauty and passion of his musical life's work with all the brilliance grace and good humor of his gentle and humble persona what a tremendous gift to me and to this ollie audience thank you and those are wonderful words to wrap up with i want to give a special thanks to renee rhoda for organizing this extraordinary um, opportunity to hear from some of our greatest performers and thank you so much uh, ken david for joining us in your from your busy schedule all the way from wisconsin and sharing your thoughts and your ideas and your behind the scenes look at at how how one lives a musical life it's and, it's been my pleasure and speaking of encores i i'm sorry that i couldn't answer but i would be happy to uh, be in touch otherwise uh, we can find avenues for that and maybe answer some other questions and besides the podcast i mentioned to you if i may actually let you know and renee mentioned that earlier the chelsea music festival has a series called online encores uh, so speaking of encores you can um, plug into that uh, it will start this month and then subsequently every two weeks if you're looking for content and everything from new music to bach uh, you have everything and jazz we have everything there and melinda and i will actually curate that and introduce a lot of those as well and i think you would enjoy that also and that's another way of staying in touch with what we're doing and i really hope that i get to see all of you in person uh next summer at the very latest thank you so much and we will look for we'll, we'll send out links to the chelsea music uh festival yeah, in your podcast um, so thank you again. And Renee, did you have some final words? This has just been a joy, Megan. Thank you, Ken David Mazur. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing our audience next week. It's just been an absolute pleasure for me. So thank you.
Likewise. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a wonderful, safe, healthy summer. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.